everybody. Welcome. I am Pamela Slim, and I'm so excited you're here in my session, The Power of Tiny Marketing Actions. It has been so fun to watch my uh, fellow presenters today behind the scenes get so excited about all of your engagement and questions. We're so committed to your success, and I want to be sharing with you today some things that hopefully will help you process an overwhelming amount of information and also, believe it or not, feel great about marketing, because those are not things sometimes that people put in the same sentence. So I am Pamela Slim, and I am an author and a business coach. I'm the co-founder of the Main Street Learning Lab here in sunny Mesa, Arizona, um, along with my husband, Daryl. And I work every day with business owners, brick and mortar owners on our Main Street here in Mesa, as well as a lot of online entrepreneurs all over the world. So right now, we are not in a normal situation, <laughs> which is an understatement. There's a Twitter uh, user who said, I always wondered what it was like to live during the times of the Civil War, Great Depression, Civil Rights Movement, Watergate, and the Dust Bowl. Not all at once, mind you, but, you know, beggars, choosers, and all. This is such a difficult time for all of us as individuals. For those of you who might be parents like me, you're trying to juggle your business with also helping your kids to do their learning virtually. Those that are in brick and mortar locations like in our main street in Mesa, it is so difficult to really have businesses shut down for such a long period of time. So part of what I want to talk about today is a method that will be helpful to you no matter what kind of external environment that we are in. But I also want to really reinforce for you that if you're feeling extra anxious, it is so normal. And I think there are ways in looking at tiny marketing actions that we can start to break things down so that they feel more manageable. And so despite all of these things happening simultaneously in our environment, you can feel excited about marketing. Whenever I'm doing work with people, and it doesn't matter how long people have been in business, if they're just starting a business, like a lot of folks I worked with uh, for my first book, Escape from Cubicle Nation, who are leaving at corporate to start their side hustle, it's normal to feel what I call marketing monsters, to have anxiousness, anxiety, to sometimes feel imposter syndrome, to just feel a little bit uncomfortable in general about marketing. Because despite you maybe having training or maybe you just started your business because you have a passion for it, there's a huge mental part to the game that's really important to understand. Part of the method that we're gonna talk about today comes from the framework from James Clear, who wrote a great book called Atomic Habits, which is really that the your, your outcomes are the lagging indicators of your habits. And I know my coach, Mark Otto, was talking about this to me the other day and he said, you want to have a predictor about what your future is going to look like? Focus on what it is that you did today. And if any of you are like me, I kind of looked around and I thought, uh-oh, I haven't done any writing on my book. I haven't necessarily planted the seeds I need to in my business. So part of what we want to do in managing our mental game is to make sure that on a daily basis, we're in this habit of really making sure we're acting every day for the things that are going to be giving us the amazing outcomes that we want. So for specific marketing monsters, I want you to take a look and think about for yourself when you know that you need to be taking a tiny marketing action or any kind of marketing action, there are a number of different quadrants of areas where a lot of business owners get stuck. The first one is really more about emotion. So an example monster that's within that quadrant is the conscious incompetent, AKA you really don't know what you don't know. So you may have never done marketing before. You don't know how to use social media. You need to write an email for your email system, but it's not necessarily something that you're comfortable with. So in this case, your emotion is something that you really just need to get a hold of. And the fix for that is to just change the way that you're thinking about the activity. If you can have a positive thought that I want to connect with my ideal customers, I want to 
create value. I want to help the folks who are paying me to solve core problems. That's going to shift your emotion so that you feel better about taking action. A second area where a lot of people get stuck and see if you identify with this is in the quadrant that has to do with knowledge. So a monster there could be the reputation protectors. You may be very proud of the work that you've done, the brand that you've built. You really don't wanna do anything that's going to sully your reputation. And so what can happen sometimes is you hold back and you don't market because you're afraid of doing it wrong. The antidote to this particular fear is really to practice an open mind and growth mindset. If anybody's ever read the great book by Carol Dweck called Mindset, this is a way that you can just look at the fact you can be as prepared as you can. And based on your preparation, if something happens, like your earbud falling out when you're doing a presentation, right? You take a nice deep breath, you learn from it, and you move on. That was actually a rehearsed uh, mistake. No, it wasn't actually. <laughs> but in this case, practice an open mind, take a tiny step so that you don't feel so much risk. And the third quadrant is more where you have mental clutter. Maybe you're feeling a little bit about that today. So you've heard some great presentations. You've gotten a lot of great advice about what you can do and you just feel overwhelmed. So the fix for that is to stop, drop and organize. One thing I highly recommend as a business coach is after you have been madly taking notes today and excited about a lot of different ideas, at the end of the day or first thing tomorrow morning, get all the ideas out prioritize and shorten it down to a list that feels actionable. The fourth quadrant that can catch up is more an integrated systems issue. So maybe you've put a lot of investment and energy into something like a big product launch. Um, the marketing monster can be here where it's I built it and no one came. So maybe in the past you put a lot of energy and money into an effort and nobody showed up to your store opening or nobody purchased your online class. And this can create a kind of anxiety based on past performance. So the best suggestion here is to surround yourself with some peers and colleagues. Maybe you can talk to a business coach. You can talk to somebody who can help you to make sure that you're really set to have success in the future. So as you're getting ready, taking these tiny marketing actions to really be focusing on some, some activities that are going to be positive for your business, try to identify any kind of marketing monsters that get in your way so that you can address them on a daily basis. Now, from a taking action perspective, in my research and experience that I've developed over really the last five years in particular, there is power and magic in tiny marketing actions. So even though you may not feel totally confident about marketing, even though you may have specific concerns, you may stress over that sales page that you create or the email that you're gonna send, when you break down your marketing activities into tiny marketing actions, it is amazing the kind of magic that happens. So I'm gonna get really specific in terms of explaining what they are, giving you some very concrete examples of which tiny marketing actions you can experiment with. And then we do have a Q&A. So I have my amazing colleagues, Lavista Jones and Rosie Pilmore, who are busily sorting through any questions that you have in this presentation so that I can answer them in the final round of Q&A. The definition of tiny marketing actions are these really small consistent actions that you take daily over an extended period of time that builds your brand, your business, and your bank account. It's really that simple. There are the kinds of activities that are really, really small, that when you get in the habit of doing them consistently are the thing that are going to make a difference. Not necessarily immediately the first time that you do it, but the habit of doing it over time. Let's look at some concrete examples. One can just be as simple as sending an email to a past client. I had somebody who I was working with who said, I, I said, let's do this tiny marketing action. They reached out, they had a favorite past client and the client said, oh my gosh, I was just thinking about you. I have a small project for you. It can be as simple as that. You could create a fun image on Canva and share it on social media. There are so many really cool tools that you can use. Maybe you have an inspirational quote or you have some kind of um, core action or lesson that you wanna share that can make it easier to share on social. 
You could introduce yourself to a reporter in a publication that is really directly serving your audience. I have been so lucky in this department because just by reaching out and recognizing that reporters are constantly looking for stories, they want people who can be providing insight, expertise, and stories, they actually don't mind when you can reach out and introduce yourself. So think about the kind of publications that your ideal audience members may enjoy. And you can reach out to introduce yourself and say, in the case where you're a business owner, you say, if you're ever doing a story on uh, brick and mortar businesses and Main Street America, feel free to use me as a source because I love the last articles that you wrote and I would love to be a resource. Building that human connection is a great example of a tiny marketing action. You could also respond to a question on a Facebook thread that's demonstrating your expertise. I don't know how many of you ever done that. I do it all the time on Facebook where I might say, does anybody know a great copywriter? Or my roof just sprung a leak. Does anybody know any great roofers in the Mesa area? And inevitably, a lot of people then will share examples in the Facebook thread. And often it's somebody who says, hey, I do that. And I have hired people all the time from somebody being connected with me and offering their services. So just being useful, being tuned in to who it is that you're connected to is a great source for tiny marketing actions. You can also send a gift to a favorite peer or colleague who would be a great source of referrals to ideal clients. So maybe this is somebody who sent you referrals before. Um, you think about something thoughtful for them that <clears throat> would just keep you top of mind and to let them know how much you appreciate the referrals. So each of these are just these small little actions taken over time that create this connective tissue that allow people to remember that you're there they know what it is that you do, they know that you're helpful, and they begin to get more interested and pay attention to your business. One of the definitions that I like to use for tiny marketing actions is that they're so small, they're almost insulting. So it's when people say, really, Pam? Like, I just pick up my cell phone and I text somebody who I'm friends with who I haven't talked to in a while, it's as simple as that, and I usually say, yeah, it's, it's kind of as simple as that. You're standing in the line at the coffee shop, you have a minute, scroll through your contacts and you send a text message. I have heard so many stories from my clients of just taking the time to go that extra step when you have a minute is the difference sometimes between somebody remembering how much they love working with you or letting you know about an opportunity coming up or for a past client to look to hire you. So don't be swayed sometimes by the glamour of looking at gigantic marketing launch campaigns. I'm as excited as you are. It's so fun to plan a launch for a big product or an event or a book. But remember that between those times where you have a huge tidal wave of activity, you have these tiny marketing actions that are slowly and powerfully building connections with ideal clients. So let's look at it really from the habit formation perspective. When you want to do something big, you want to make a shift from, let's say, not feeling very healthy in general, knowing that you want to be more active and move more. If you plan the first week to always shop at the local farmer's market and buy organic produce and cook seven nights a week and do a 10 mile walk every night in your neighborhood, you're probably not likely to do it. A better thing to do would be just to say, let me drink a little bit of extra water every day. By drinking one extra glass of water a day is going to slowly get you in the habit of A, feeling better because you have a really tangible kind of goal that you can work on. Your body starts to feel a little bit better. You get more hydrated. You, you, are, you think a little bit more clearly, it dilutes all the coffee that I know I drink on a daily basis. And so this is something that can slowly begin to be a habit that then can lead to other things where you say, gosh, I thought it was gonna be really hard to drink more water, but it's really not that hard. And so maybe I could take a 10 minute walk around my neighborhood. Maybe I could make that choice to really eat something that not only is delicious, but also feels like it's really fueling for me. So these are the kinds of ways that tiny marketing actions tend to back into 
your longer term goals. And I'll tell you in the work that I've done with a lot of clients over the years, no matter what your situation is, I know for a lot of folks that are my colleagues here on Main Street in Mesa, this has been such a difficult time. Some have seen their business that was really growing absolutely shut down and it is easy to feel very panicked and very overwhelmed and like you need to be taking immediate action. But by taking these tiny marketing actions, really working with your fear, getting in the habit, developing a momentum, you're much more likely to be sustainable. And this kind of thing can and will shift you out of a situation of feeling like you don't have enough customers. And over time can really get you back once we're all able to be in that situation to a much more healthy and sustainable place. So like I was mentioning before, this idea of habit formation, when you look at it from your business perspective, for some of you, you are solopreneurs, I imagine. So it's just you who run your business. For others of you, you might have staff and you have a, a bigger organization. So from the individual business owner perspective, if it's only you, if you're a solopreneur or freelancer, then your marketing habits are usually the specific activities that you do on a regular basis in order to be connecting with your audience. So they're literally habits that you know you personally need to get into. I need to send that text to somebody. I need to make sure I'm sending out my newsletter on a regular basis. I need to reach out that time in a virtual conference in the chat <clears throat> and talk to somebody who looks like they could be a good partner for me. So that would be a case where it is individual habits that are being built. What happens over time if you have a little bit of a larger company is then these habits begin to work into your marketing operations. And when you see successful things that you can start to do that really connect you with your ideal clients and get you business, then you wanna to begin to operationalize them. So we can think about it from both of these perspectives, individual habits, and then eventually organizational habits so that you're not the only one who is marketing your business, it's your entire team. The research behind habit formation and these tiny habits, or like James Clear calls them atomic habits, is pretty astounding. So his research said that if you get, if you just focus on being 1% better each day, just taking a little bit of an action, a little bit, 1% more than you took the day before, by the end of a year, you'll be 37 times better, not percent, but times. And so this is something I find that is really staggering and it speaks to the power of slowly and methodically building these connections and building these different marketing activities. It, the change often at first is something that's so small that you don't necessarily recognize it. But over time, you begin to build that strength and you begin to build the competence. I'm a former martial artist. I did capoeira for 11 years, the Afro-Brazilian martial art. And then in my 40s, I went into MMA, mixed martial arts, until I got my black belt. <laughs> and one of the things I noticed whenever I was starting new, like when I went to MMA from Capoeira, is it's natural to want to immediately just be the best, to see all the results, to fight like a black belt. And really what I started to shift martial arts in my 40s, but every day if I showed up, if I did all the work, slowly built the strength in my body, that over time I would have the mental strength in order to perform at a high level. And I'm happy to say I did get my black belt in 2013 um, after five hard years of training with my teacher. So we'll think about it that way, slowly building those habits. So here's a couple things that are important to get ready to do that. One of them is improving your environment. You clean things out, you wanna get yourself organized, like I said before. Look at your big list of things and all the actions that you want to do and break them down into small, manageable, clean your you know, things out, set some calendar blocks in order to make sure that you have time to do these tiny marketing actions. If you like motivational quotes, you could put that on your, on your desk. The other thing you want to do is just to simplify, make things as small as possible. And so using some hacks where you can take a big task and maybe break it down into a small part. Create shortcuts and templates. I don't know if any of you use Text Expander. I'm a huge fan of it. It's a cool plugin that you can get 
on your computer. So if you're, if you're normally, let's say you have a tiny marketing action to reach out and um, introduce yourself to a journalist, you can sort what they call a snippet so that you can which then you customize and send off. Any of these things to simplify your actions are more likely to do them. Thinking. Really try to stop yourself from only measuring the impact of one small action the next day. Try to look in the long term and see how your habits can really generally improve and recognize that when you're doing marketing, you're really building relationships real and building relationships with real people takes time. So here are a couple very specific recipes. I get super excited to share and I taste test. So if you see something that looks good, my challenge to you is really even before I finish the presentation, see if you can get one small marketing action out the door. So here's social media. Some of you may not know that Pinterest is actually a source coming to your, your website. So if you have a blog, you could go to Canva, you could create some graphics that you can share on Pinterest. And then for that particular post, you can send them back maybe to a post that you wrote on your blog and your website. And this can be a way to get good additional traffic. I thought Pinterest was really just for like choosing out cool layouts for, for new room design, but it's much more than that. Partnerships. There, it's really important to understand that for some of your ideal clients, they may belong to certain associations and see if you could reach out. If you just go to a, the association website, you could introduce yourself as an expert and offer to write an article or maybe do um, a webinar or interview a member. This can be a great way to be connecting one to many with people who are ideal clients. <clears throat> Another example um, is really to create a playlist. For those of you who are a little bit music, more musical, you could create a playlist um, that can inspire your clients to be doing whatever it is that you wanna help them do. And um, it was really fun. One of my clients, uh, Jessica Williams in Chicago, who works with people who specifically are starting side hustles, did this tiny marketing action as part of an assignment she had when we were working together. And she created a side hustle uh, playlist, which was really fun. She posted it on LinkedIn. And I kid you not, one minute later, somebody said, oh my gosh, I was just thinking about starting a side hustle. I forgot that you did that. Can we set up a call? And she got a new client. So for those of you who have fun creating playlists, it can also be a way to raise awareness of what it is that you do to support your clients. Referrals are really powerful. And when you can identify connectors, if any of you have ever read the book, The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, he talks about mavens, people with deep subject matter expertise, salespeople, um, people who are really good at selling ideas, and connectors. Connectors are people who know a whole bunch of people and they also love to connect people with each other. So when you're thinking about the kind of ideal audience that you want to reach and your ideal customer, think about your connectors who are connected to either those partners or to somebody who would be a good partner to reach them. And this can be a way to, to you know, if you're thinking about this project, I really want to do this big event. Um, do you know anybody who might be a good connection? And connectors love to connect. The way you can make it easy for us, I will include myself in that because I love to connect people with each other, is maybe when you're sending an email, letting them know specifically who you're looking for, write the email with the intention of knowing that they're probably going to be sharing it with somebody else. So it just removes a step of complication you don't maybe put a little personalized note in that one, just know that they're gonna forward it on to people who, who are great fits. And that's a really good way to leverage the strength of the connectors in your network. Um, in, on social media, in, in particularly in LinkedIn, think about past jobs that you've had or maybe past clients that you've had and people who you really enjoyed working with. On LinkedIn, it is a great way that you can look folks up that maybe you haven't seen in a while. You can look through your company listing. If uh, you've had a number of jobs and you forget sometimes who you're connected to and <clears throat> send a message to reach out and see how it is that they're doing. 
I was actually preparing this tiny marketing action to share it the other day. And I thought, you know what? I have not reached out to my host brother from the exchange year that I spent in Switzerland when I was in high school. And so I looked him up and lo and behold, he was there on LinkedIn. I connected with him on Facebook. He happens to be a business owner, <laughs> which, is, which is an added bonus. But sometimes we forget, we forget these people in our past who loved working with us or who we had a really strong connection with where we can really reinvigorate that kind of connection. So looking for past connections and just doing, using the message feature on LinkedIn, just to send a quick note and say, you know, it was so good, you know, to, to, I was just thinking the other day about the work that we did together. How are you? What's, what's going on? I think with COVID happening, it is really a wonderful time to check in with your network and just see in general how people are doing. Have a note about this that has to do with style is a lot of folks will worry, I think with good reason, of not wanting to be over the top and be too salesy, right? So not there's a difference between saying, Hey Joe, it was so great working with your me. I see you're at Google now. Would you mind giving me an introduction to the head of HR? That is probably a couple steps too far, right? In when you're warming up and you're reconnecting with people. Take that tiny step to first just reach out and say, Joe, I loved working with you. How are you? How's the family? That's a way at first just to, to reconnect, begin to have a little bit of conversation. It can connect to the next really important kind of tiny marketing action, which is often setting up a, a 15 or 20 minute quick, nice to see you video chat where you can learn a little bit more about what's going on with the person. But start really small and be a little bit cautious about coming in from out of the blue and immediately asking for something, because that's not often something that's really comfortable. Um, referrals. One of my favorite TMAs in the universe is what I call the peanut butter and jelly strategy. And that is where when you think about the kind of people who you work with and what core problem or challenge they may have, there are other service professionals often or other business owners who also care about solving that particular problem for your client. So speaking for myself, I work with business owners. I work with a lot of people who are scaling their business. And so when I'm doing my work, they are also hiring lawyers. They have CPAs. They have other specialists in marketing, SEO consultants, web designers, photographers, copywriters. You start to see this example of so many other types of service providers or businesses that are also working with that client. So when you can identify that, then you can reach out and introduce yourself and say, hey, I noticed that you, you did the new website design for our client. Great job, it was so beautiful. I'm a business coach working with them and I really work to make sure we get to know those kinds of peanut butter and jelly connections, highly complimentary, not competitive connections, hundreds of referrals. My client, uh, Heather Krause, who's a data scientist in Toronto, is really a perfect example to me of the power of TMAs. We really worked together to start her initiative, which is called We All Count to Reduce Bias in Data Science for Data Scientists. Um, and it was a new initiative that she started from the ground up. She's a self-identified introvert, was not as comfortable at first doing marketing activities. And so we just broke things down into tiny, tiny little bits. And she did what she called the summer of seeding, where she spent the summer doing consistent tiny marketing actions. We are now seeing the benefits of that growth where she is selling out classes that she's delivering. She has really large influential clients who are reaching out for her to do, her to do really big consulting projects. And it's so validating to see that just by having a focus and taking tiny marketing actions that can make a big difference. So in summing up for the plan, you, you want to summarize and really think about what are these kinds of activities that you're taking, maybe where are parts in your, in your ecosystem around your clients, do you have folks who can be supportive and where do you want to focus your efforts. You can think about the kind of social channels that would be the best places for you to connect based on where it is that you think your clients hang out. And then you also want to think about what are ways that you're consistently maybe having a podcast or an email newsletter or some kind of beacon 
in order to be sharing your information. This is a basic kind of a mini plan that I have a little playbook for if you're interested, but this is a way that can be kind of a foundation for your tiny marketing actions. And so I think finally, um, there's a the playbook you could download at pamelaslim.com forward slash TMA hyphen playbook. If you wanna get a little bit more background just to create your mini plan. And then if you wanna connect with me, one tiny marketing action could be to reach out on LinkedIn and introduce yourself. I'm just at pamelaslim.com and pamelaslim on LinkedIn. So now we get to the good part, which is where I can now open up and look at your specific questions. So let's hear what it is that you're thinking about. And let me answer some questions. It looks like we have a, another Atomic Habits fan, which is great. I'm really excited that you are interested in um, the book Atomic Habits. It's really been great to um, just read it and see some of the scientific method behind habits, because I find in anything that you do, understanding that science is going to be more likely for you to take action. The, uh, the link that I just mentioned was PamelaSlim.com forward slash TMA hyphen playbook. PamelaSlim.com forward slash TMA hyphen playbook. And that has a playbook that can summarize some of the information we talked about today and, and give you a little bit more guidance in terms of creating a marketing plan. Um, all right, another question from Steve was, should I use Facebook ads or Google ads to drive traffic to my website? Which platform is more profitable? It, I would have to know a little bit more information, I think, Steve, in order to make that determination. There are different factors that go into analyzing the best kind of platforms for you. And to me, a lot of it is based on your particular audience definition and understanding the behavior of your, of your ideal clients. First of all, it's our, when, when I'm not sure what kind of business that you have, feel free to add it if you want to the, um, to the Q and a, so I can understand a little bit more, but if you know that you get a lot of income referral, search traffic where people are just searching for something maybe specific that you do and you notice and you track over time that that's a great source for you of business, then putting a photo into Google ads for in a period of time can be something that's really helpful because if you have an, you know, an online business or even for some of the brick and mortar businesses where you can, you can zero in and dominate a particular search term, that can be really helpful. For Facebook, I've heard many things from many people. I know we probably have experts within our circle of experts here within, within this entire day. There are so many changes that can happen within the Facebook algorithms. There can be changes in, in advertising that if you know that your ideal clients really do hang out on Facebook, the variables that, that will impact your financial success that you have with ads are not just the platform but it's also is the message that you're sharing one that's reaching your ideal clients. Do you have them targeted the right way so that you're using your ad spend for more of a focused definition on, you know, like audiences as opposed to really a broad audience. When you ask them to, to click over and maybe to uh, either join your email list or buy a product or service, do you have compelling copy that inspires them to take action? So all of these things add up to say <laughs> that it depends. Um, I would look at specifically what your goals and objectives are. What is the behavior of the, the clients that you have as to where they hang out? And if you do do some kind of an advertising campaign, I would look to get some very specific expertise to make sure you're targeted in your efforts so you have a good return on your investment. Um, all right. Um, Andrea was asking, um, what's the one thing that I would advise a new business to do to start? It's a great question because I do, I've worked a, many years, probably about 10 years at Escape from Cubicle Nation of really doing that early, early stage entrepreneurship. So maybe there's not just one thing, but let me think of maybe two, maybe three. So the first thing I think is to recognize when you're first starting a business that really that first year in business 
is your laboratory. It's the time where you're going to be testing and trying different assumptions. I have seen so many different business ideas, all of which sounded, you know, in some cases amazing on paper or as a general idea where it seemed like it was a big need. There was a need in the market for it. The person who was delivering the service or product was the perfect person to deliver it. But it doesn't always translate into actual business results. And so I've seen a lot of people invest a huge amount of money and time and energy into trying to get everything perfect before they even launch. And that's the thing that can actually really get you stuck because I only believe the contact with the market in terms of results. That's the only way we know if an idea is actually viable in the real world where people besides your mom, your sister, and your best friend will buy your product is where you can take your idea, create enough of a you know basic offering so that somebody who doesn't know you can be moved enough to take out their credit card and purchase it. Like that's the real test if something is gonna happen in the real world or if you can get a real person to walk in your store and have them purchase something. So knowing that the first year is about testing and trying, getting used to having this growth mindset where you don't spend too much energy get, getting everything perfect before you start is going to be really helpful to you. And I think the second thing is recognizing that you really want to be zeroing in and focusing on who your ideal customer is, not so much by demographics, but by a core problem or challenge that they face. This is a method from my friend Susan Beyer of Audience Audit, who is here in the Phoenix area. And she's an audience researcher. And she really talks about how if we're just generally saying, talking about our demographic is like, I serve people in the eight, from the age of 25 to 55. It doesn't tell us really anything specific about what problem that you actually solve. So if you were to have a cafe, you would say, you know, I cater to people who love to come into a warm, artistic environment where they're greeted like a family friend. That would be something a little bit different than saying my coffee shop serve between 25 and 55, right? When, when I hear the description of the audience of like, yes, I want to go to a cafe that's beautiful, filled with art and where I'm greeted like a family member, then I'm going to be drawn to go to that place. So try to really have a little bit of focus. Think about the kind of problem that your business is solving, and it's going to be much easier for you to come up with marketing messages. Um, I just opened an insurance brokerage in July 2020, and I'm learning all about social media and digital marketing. I've learned about Facebook posting and ads, Google ads, doing giveaways, have a separate Facebook group page that's not insurance related to build your audience. And I'm not doing something right as I'm not getting the results. What do you suggest I focus on? Congratulations for opening your firm. And, you know, on one hand, it does sound like it's great that you're zeroing in and you are looking and investing in specific activities to drive business. The one thing I don't hear so much of, of you describing for this particular business of an insurance brokerage is looking at human connections. And I know for the relationship that I have with agent who we've, we've had for over 20 years, you might want to look at first reaching out when you're, when you're new and connecting with people and maybe having short conversations. It's a little bit more of research in understanding what are some of the things in particular that people might be concerned about with insurance? What are ways, if you think about your ideal kind of customer, would it be a young family? Would it be folks nearing retirement? Is it business owners where you want to get a complete set of business from home insurance and car insurance and business insurance, right? Depending on how it is that you identify your ideal market, see if you can do some things to reach out and connect with people um, in a real way. I'm a fan in COVID times, but also in non-COVID times of also just doing um, informational like webinars. So there could be things that you could do to help demystify the kinds of, of challenges that people have with insurance. So I'll just use the example because I get lots of questions all the time from people who um, know that they need to get business insurance, but they don't really understand how it all works. So you could do an informational webinar saying, demystify the process of getting business insurance, right? Don't spend more that you need to get the, the amount of coverage that you need for your business or something like that. This could be a way that you could share um, the, the registration on social media 
give real human people the chance to interact and connect with you. And even at first, if you don't have a lot of people who are registering and attending, you have created a useful presentation that then you can share with other people and that you can look to repeat in other places. Let's think about a couple of the specific tiny marketing actions I talked about. Associations. So if there is an association um, of business owners, for example, where you would want to be connecting with them and, and demystifying insurance, that is a really great activity to do because now you're not just reaching out to your existing network. You might pitch doing a helpful webinar for their association members, which will then put you in front of sometimes score, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of people who might have the kinds of questions and problems that you can solve. And I know in, in the insurance business, it is such a personal thing that people want to feel good in having that connection with you. So do a webinar where you do have your video on and you can send a useful follow-up and you can always say, if anybody wants to have a conversation, here's my email, let's set up a, a you know, 15, 20 call so I can, I can answer some basic questions. I think those are ways that you can start to make a little progress and just realize it is a re really short period of time that you've been in there. So I'd say find some ways to maybe expand a few of your different tiny marketing actions to involve connections with people. And, um, and I think you're gonna start to see, um, see some clients come your way. That's my hope for you. Um, can I recommend an effective way to find potential companies that a solopreneur can form alliances or partner with on consulting projects? Uh, this is from Brenda. Yes, one of the one of the ways to to look at and evaluate potential partners is <clears throat> to ask the customers that you work with. So Brenda, I'm not sure who your clients are or what it is that they do or what kind of problem that you solve. But as a solopreneur, where you're working with them on one particular issue, ask them who what are other kind of service providers that they need to connect with on a regular basis is one way to think about some of these peanut butter and jelly partners. So you could say, you know, do you love your web designer? Do you love your accountant? Do you love your, your lawyer? The other thing is what I worked on a lot when I was a consultant, I was a management consultant for the first 10 years of my business in Silicon Valley. And we had what we called an unofficial confederation. So there were a number of us consultants that each had subject matter expertise in different areas. And because we all knew each other, that sometimes we might get a call from a larger company to do maybe a bigger, like human resource redesign project. And so then we would be pulling in each other to be doing a bigger kind of project. So in that case, maybe you wanna look at for the specific services that you provide, if you had more capability through partners, what would be that bigger kind of problem that you solve? What would be that bigger kind of project that you could be selling? And that's where you can identify who might be good partners that you could do that work with. Just a little word of caution, try to start small. Often you don't really know what it's like to work with somebody until you've gotten a project or two under your belt. And so take the time to really and get to know um, get to know the person um, before you commit to doing a year long project. I've just seen far too much in my time um, to, to rush into things. Um, Lisa, you said the subject I'm interested in has literally hundreds of websites, but my ideal clients are a tiny percentage within that. So some you're worried about whether effort to learn and develop your idea is worth it. Although it would be on more selling and educational aspects such as classes rather than products. You know, Lisa, I think that a viable business idea is where you do solve a problem that is a real problem in the real world, that there are enough paying people who have that problem that um, are willing to spend money on it, and that also you have a specific expertise in order to solve that problem. And of course, on the marketing side and copywriting that you can present the case for working with you in a way that gets people to want to work with you. So the early stages of business, when you are really looking for an, a business idea, it does involve a lot of testing and trying. And this is that example I was giving earlier of making sure that you give yourself some chances to maybe focus in and, and create some small offering. See if there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a way that you can be connecting with people in a small way in order to see if there's viability. 
So before you really go full bore in building something out, I'm, I, I would suggest really testing and trying that. <clears throat> All right, we have, we're just rounding the clock with our last uh, minute or 30 seconds. Um, and so any kind of follow-up, I know that I don't really have time to answer more specific questions. Feel free to reach out on LinkedIn if you want. Go ahead and, and ask a question there, and I'm happy to answer it just in a direct message. I'm Pamela Slim on LinkedIn. Um, but it has been delightful to be with all of you. I'm so thankful to GoDaddy, my team of fellow presenters. I hope today has been rich and wonderful for you. And I just want to remind you to take tiny actions. Thank you so much.